social neuroscience is what we would call an emerging area, uh, a new area. Because even cognitive neuroscience, which has only been around since the early 1990s, is a new field. What does it mean? It means that we now have better methods, better instruments to interrogate the brain directly. Psychologists are people who study how the mind works. How do we normally study the mind? We study it by observing behavior and measuring behavior. I have to click a key on a keyboard. I have to answer a question. You might even measure how much do I smile? How much do I frown? Which muscles are moving? These are all different ways in which we we, that we use to try to find out what's going on inside. Because this is not transparent. It is locked in a nice box. And we have to figure out in the science of psychology what is that thing between our ears doing? And it is a very hard job. It is incredibly hard to figure out what are the right inferences. How do we know? It is not different from asking the question of what was the origin of the universe. That's a very hard question because we cannot go to the origin of the universe and unfold that tape and just observe what happened when the, when the universe was formed. Although these days, maybe we're getting better and better and better at getting further and further away from now to say, aha, we now know that the universe is x billion years older. And so likewise, I would say, we look for instruments. One of the most important of these uh, techniques is something called fMRI, functional magnetic resonance imaging. It is like MRI, which many people are aware of because they've had to have their knee or their neck scanned, uh, where through an MRI you get a very nice picture of the anatomy of, of your body, some part of your body. We're not interested in the anatomy of the brain. We are roughly interested in it, but much more we're interested in the F that is placed before MRI, fMRI, functional magnetic resonance imaging. And what fMRI does is allows access to the workings of the brain by looking at the amount of um, uh, blood that is going to particular parts of the brain when we are thinking particular thoughts. But we don't have a direct measure of blood flow. We have a proxy. We can estimate how much blood is flowing by looking at the amount of oxygen that is being released indifferent. The idea is more blood, more oxygen. So we can measure oxygen levels and uh, get something called a bold signal. And looking at that, we can see where different thinking is happening. Now, the interest here in social neuroscience is that when I sit thinking about the mind of another person, is my brain doing the same thing as when I sit around thinking about my office, about the chair in my office? Do I, does my brain use the same regions of the brain to think about how is my chair put together? My chair is a very fancy chair. It allows me to move and does all kinds of things because I have a bad back. So I have a fancy chair that has many moving parts. And so when I think, how does my chair work? Does my brain do the same thing roughly as if I ask something about my student? How does my student, Anne, think about this? And my impression had been that of course the brain is only that small, uh, three pounds. Uh, it cannot have different regions to think about chair versus and versus this and that. So my assumption was that we have a general purpose system here. It will use some resource to analyze how something works. And that whether it's a chair or a person, it'll be doing roughly the same thing. And I was quite surprised when the data showed that I'm completely wrong, that for human brains, other people are very special. We think about other people in a very particular way, and we reserve certain regions of the brain to do the work to try to understand why this person did something or why did they do something. So if I ask you a simple question, which has more strings, a violin or a guitar? You think about it and you give me an answer. Okay? If I say to you, who is more likely to uh, carry a hammer, a carpenter or a lawyer? You have an answer. It's based on some fact or some base rate of who's going to do more. It turns out that our brain does not think these two questions the same way. It will answer the question about the instruments because they are physical objects 
that are not social. It will answer that question using a particular set of regions of the brain, and those are completely separate and different from answering the question, um, who is more likely to carry a hammer, a carpenter or a lawyer? Carpenters and lawyers are social beings. Uh, if I say, who's more likely to wear a tuxedo, a man or a woman? You know the answer to that question, but to give that answer, your brain is using a very different region than it would use to answer the question about violins um, and, and uh, guitars, let's say. All right, so now we know this result. It's a result that came out of our lab in the work of a, a very wonderful colleague of mine called Jason Mitchell. And Jason has been doing this work, uh, looking at how is the social world represented differently in our minds than the physical world. And it turns out that there are different networks in, in the brain that are being used to do this. I will give you one example that goes a little bit further, and it's quite interesting. Let's say that you are similar to me. Let us say that you are a political liberal. And I don't know what your politics are. I don't know what anybody's politics are. But let me imagine that I meet somebody and I say, I find out what are their politics. And let's say that they're liberal. And let us imagine that I happen to be liberal. Okay? I'm not going to tell you what I am. but I can. Just. Now, that person becomes similar to me. But imagine that I meet somebody and that person is a conservative person. And let's say I am liberal. Now, this person is different from me. It turns out, in the research that we did, that we find that when we think about these two different kinds of people, again, our brain is trying to separate them in some way to say, this one is like me. This one is not like me. And we actually use slightly different parts of our brain to even do the thinking about them. To us, this has some deep moral interests, because it says that a judge, a police officer, a teacher, they are not approaching everybody thinking who's similar or different consciously. They think they're being quite fair. They're being the same with both people. But these data suggest that they're actually using different parts of neural real estate to be doing the thinking about these folks. And what's interesting is that the neurons that are being used to think about the similar other, they happen to be in a region that we'll call the, the, ventral, uh, re the ventral area of medial prefrontal cortex. So those are the neurons that are used to think about the similar other, which are also the neurons that we use to think about ourselves. And that's very interesting. I'm special to me. And so when I'm special to me, I also take other people who are politically similar, and I represent them in the same place in my brain where I might represent myself. But the conservative other, or somebody who might be different from me, if I'm liberal, then that person gets moved to a more dorsal part of medial prefrontal cortex, in the amount of, in the kind of, in the kind of structures that are coming online to do the thinking about them. This is extremely important for us to know. It's important for us to know because we continue to live our lives believing that that's not happening, that we are treating everybody the same, and this science is beginning to show us that, in fact, our brains very early in thinking about people might be using very different parts of the brain to do the thinking that may lead us eventually to very different conclusions about these people. Now, is it possible that the study we did with political difference can also, these differences can also be observed with other kinds of differences? Racial difference, gender difference, age difference, nationality difference, even language differences, and so on. We do not know the answer to that question because we have not done the full range of those kinds of studies. What we do know from other work is that it probably does matter. So I'll give you, uh, I'll, I'll provide one example. In Italy, this was a study that was done. Y you have to r watch a video, and the video is the video of a hand into which an injection is being placed. So a needle, like a doctor's syringe, is being put on the hand, and you watch the needle entering the hand. Most of us, when we see that, something happens to us. Our, our, our fingers will you know, get a little more wet from sweat, because we found that to be a little bit aversive, a little not very, not very nice. Now, here's the interesting thing about the study. You change the hand. The, into which the needle is going. It can be either a black person's hand or a white person's hand. Will, will I, when I watch a video of a black person being 
possibly in pain versus a white person being possibly in pain? Will my body respond the same way? Well, if I, the idea here is that if you care equally, it should be the same. But if you don't care as much about one person over the other, the amount of sweat that your fingers will produce should vary. And this study showed, indeed, that certainly for white Italians, the what we call skin conductance levels, the amount of sweat that your, your body produces when you see such a thing, is less when it is a black hand that is receiving the injection compared to a white hand. Now, so these might again suggest, we don't have the data from the brain, but there are lots of other results that we can use to, to show that there are indeed differences in the way in which we think about other people. And the important thing here is that we are not aware of that. You know, consciously, if you ask me, how do you feel about black and white people, I'll say I love them all equally. But the results show that I do not. And now I have to come face to face with that, and this is why the science is so important. You know how when you take a telescope in an older science, like in astronomy, and you turn it outside, and you see things happening amongst planets, and that theory of what is happening there, the data are not fitting with your theory. Galileo had that experience, right? I would say that for us, as, as 21st century mind scientists, we have exactly the same problem that we face. Many of the things that we believed about ourselves are going to be shown to be not true. And we have to be ready to deal with those. There is a very interesting question of what is it that I would want to know <laughs> the answer to that we don't know about yet in this area of social neuroscience. Almost nothing is known in social neuroscience, so everything remains to be understood. But I think the big question is really in a sense, the question of consciousness. At some point, our species evolved in, in a different way so that we achieved such something that we call conscious awareness. We have this property. We can look inside our own minds and we can try to figure out what's there. And if we don't like it, we can change ourselves and do something different. No other species has this cap capacity. And I think what we call sort of the hard problem uh, of, uh, of consciousness is, is, is basically trying to understand what, what is it, what is it that, that, that this thing that we call consciousness is and, and how does it differentiate us uh, from other species and what are the things that we can do to change ourselves once we understand ourselves a little bit better. <laughs>